Welcome to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast, where you can learn and be inspired by real-world examples of how technology is transforming businesses and reshaping industries in a language everyone can understand. Here is your host, Neil C. Hughes. Welcome back to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast. The sun is shining here in the UK and life seems to be flirting with normality again. But today... I want you to look up to those skies and think bigger than your town, city, country, continent, and even this planet. And join me in exploring the art of the possible. Because today's guest is Luca Rosentini, CEO and founder of the Italy-based D-Orbit, which is the global market leader in the space logistics and transportation service industry. And he's going to join me today and talk about how they have a track record of space-proven technologies, successful missions, and customer outcomes. And yes, we've all seen those pictures from Mars being beamed back to our televisions and laptops and phones. But today, we're going to be talking about the space logistics technology and transportation solutions that are playing a critical role in taking us beyond planet Earth. So buckle up. And hold on tight so I can beam your ears all the way to Italy so we can speak with Luca about all this and much more. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell the listeners a little about who you are and what you do? Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm uh, Luca, um, the the founder and the CEO of uh, The Orbit. And uh, the Orbit is a company that is creating the first uh, space logistics infrastructure. So in space, um, and just just to uh, uh, let's say provide you more details why space logistics, right? So well, because um, I think we take logistics for granted here here on Earth. Uh, but if you think about, it, there will be no business without logistics. Even if you produce, I don't know, like pens, then you need someone to go to the factory, pick up the pens, bring them to the distributor, and then to the to the local shop uh, where you can buy a pen for like pennies. And uh, this is not available in space today. So what the orbit does, take care of the transportation of satellites exactly at the final destination, pretty much like a... Uh, um, like a post truck, right? So you put all the packages in the in the truck, and then the truck, uh, once you reach space, it moves around to deliver the packages that are the satellites in the right location where they start immediately their business. This is what we are doing now, uh, and this is essential for what we are also doing that is working on the in-orbit servicing and active debris removal that is one uh, of the most important aspects and bottleneck, by the way, uh, of the space sector. And one of the things I try and do on this daily tech podcast is get get people thinking about things that they don't automatically associate with technology and thinking differently about things. And of course, at the moment, we're all excited about seeing these images being beamed back to Earth from Mars. But how that equipment gets to Mars and everything and the logistics around it is something that possibly we don't think about. And as you said, you are the CEO and founder of the Ital- Italy-based D-Orbit, which is a global market leader in the space logistics and transportation services industry. You you guys have a great track record of space-proven technologies, successful missions and customer outcomes. But just to help listeners understand a little bit more about what you do, can you tell me a little bit more about the problems that you're solving for your customers with your technology? Yeah, yeah. So let's um, let's do a step back and let's see how we we get to this situation, right? So um, let's say for 70 years, the the space market was uh, dominated by government. Right, so the government really, governments really helped to create the first layer of infrastructure that enable all of us to take benefits from the space. So even if we don't know today, eighty percent of the technology that we use on a daily basis, it's coming directly or indirectly from space. And this, this is really thanks to what happened in, in the in the last decades. Uh, what what happened? What is happening now? is, uh, let's say, 
10,000 satellites in 70 years, and now there are 65,000 satellites planned to be launched in space, uh, exactly for, for what you were saying before. So to deliver services to Earth, uh, they take pictures, they, take, uh, they provide information for agriculture. I mean, agriculture is becoming agri-tech, uh, finance services is becoming fintech, uh, uh, oil and gas, uh, forestry, also weather forecasting, um, uh, like monitoring pollution, but also help in case of natural disaster. So all these companies, there are more than 400 new companies now, um, all venture back, so all with private capital, uh, that are launching satellites in order to provide this service to, to us here, to our society on Earth. The issue is that 65,000 satellites are really a lot for space, and, uh, and they all need to get to space. So first of all, they need to find a rocket capable of bringing them into the right orbit, so in, in, into the right location. But it, this is not enough because you are not launching one big satellite. So you are launching several uh, small satellites that are called constellations. And so you need to have the satellite exactly in the right position in order to operate. And this today, uh, let's, let's assume you find the rocket uh, that usually takes between one and two years just to find the right rocket. Uh, you, you find the rocket, so you are in space now, and then you have a cluster of satellites all, all together that they need to disperse and, uh, and, you know, and go around the same orbit around the planet. And, and this is taking between six and ten months today. That is about one-third of the life of the satellite. So you are sacrificing one-third of the revenues. And this is not good, of course, for, for these companies. But on top of that, if you need to go into other location, and 95% of this business need different locations, then you need to buy one rocket for each location. What we do at the orbit, we take care of all of this. So we pack all the satellites into a big cargo, uh, a cargo satellite, uh, that we send the cargo in space, and then we switch on our engines, and then we move around space, to deploy the satellites exactly where they need to be, uh, where they need to operate, and uh, um, say we reduce the time by eighty-five percent doing that, so we can do it in a few weeks, and we reduce also the overall cost of deployment uh, by forty percent. It's incredibly cool what you're doing here. And be before you came on the uh, the podcast today, I was reading that in your 10-year history, you have successfully flown 44 payloads into space. I mean, can you expand on that? Because it feels like an incredible achievement. Yeah. So, well, we, we started in, in 2013. Our first launch in space was in 30, uh, 2013. Mm -hmm. uh, where uh, at that time, new space was not existing, right? So we were still in a like very initial phase of the market transition. And what we did, we send in orbit uh, a bunch of technologies that we have developed in order to test them. And uh, it was very, very hard to find the possibility to get to space. So at that time, I, I, even today it's not easy, but let's say now, now it's easier. Uh, and then since then we flew again in 2017, uh, we had to build our own satellite. So we had um, another piece of very in interesting technology uh, to address the problem of space debris. Maybe we can talk later about that. But I say um, uh, it, it was very difficult to find a way to test it in orbit. So, so what we did, we built our own satellite and, uh, uh, and we sent it in space uh, in order to pay you know, for the expenditures. Uh, we found other companies that they had the same issues that, as we had, so to test their technology in orbit, we put their technology in the in the satellite and we test them. So we also validated the first concept of satellite for rent. So we were renting the satellite to other customers in order for them to get the validation. Then we launched um, a cargo full of satellites um, last year uh, after 1.5 year delay on the launch. So that's, that's, you know, that's something that in this industry can happen. And uh, in January, we launch another cargo completely, completely booked, so full of satellites. Uh, we have on board 20 satellites. We already deployed eight, and now we are approaching the phase in which we are going to deploy the other 12. And in June, so in two months, 
we are going to fly again another cargo and like fully booked. And the interesting aspect is that we are going to fly uh, 13 different nationalities in that cargo. So this is a really a global market. And one of the things that I find incredibly exciting is we're starting to think bigger than our own planet and exploring how we can become an interplanetary species, as Elon Musk said a few weeks ago. But can you tell me more about space logistics and how, just like companies on Earth, they all depend on logistic providers? And the future of space will also obviously require logistics companies, won't it? Yeah, yeah. So um, let's let's take an example of... Uh, of uh, le- le- Let's go to Mars. So everybody now is talking about uh, going to Mars, create a colony on Mars, right? Um, I think what actually we are aiming today and uh, it's uh, to have uh, the first outpost on Mars. So to go there and, you know, put our feet on the, on the land and say, yes, we, we reach Mars. But that's, that's not a colony. So a colony is a self-sustainable uh, environment. And uh, in order to get there, you need to go back and forward several times from Earth, transporting all the materials, the people, you know, foods and, and, and everything. And um, so if you don't have a, a logistics service that uh, enable the, all of this, uh, it will be so expensive that, no, I mean, not even a government or a company uh, can afford that. So we really need to have an infrastructure, an orbital infrastructure that enable all these companies and the governments to be way more efficient in terms of cost, in terms of time, in order to to arrive there. And this is not just for Mars. Uh, Moon is another example. So our cargo today has has enough uh, capabilities to reach the Moon and deploy satellites around the Moon. Uh, So if we want to have a a base on the Moon, uh, well, it's good to have a base on the Moon, but then uh, you will have people, you know, walking on the Moon, like, exploring, uh, doing research and everything, and they will need internet connection. And so uh, it's very likely that you will need a constellation of satellites around the moon to provide the service connected to Earth as well. How you get there, it's it's not trivial. You cannot just send a bunch of satellites from Earth and then each of them, they will fly, you know, alone and and together. It will be very inefficient. So uh, if you have a cargo that is able to transport all of this, this is definitely cheaper and and faster. And if we went, if we want to go a little bit more into science fiction, uh, but, you know, for me, science fiction is the science of tomorrow, right? Mm-hmm. So, and what we are doing today was considered science fiction 10 years ago. So uh, science fiction is really a, a, a concept that, uh, that, uh, that we should uh, uh, consider uh, carefully. So let's say if we consider the asteroid belt uh, and the transportation of raw material from asteroids, also in that case, uh, you need logistic service. I do remember... Uh, a few years ago, there was a company that was already designing a system to go and uh, grab an asteroid and start mining the asteroid to extract raw material. And in fact, they immediately understood the need of a logistic service. And we were working together on that concept. So of course, it's far in the future. Uh, but definitely, if you don't start today <clears throat> to build this infrastructure, then when you need it, it will be too late. And one of the services D-Orbit offers is an in-orbit transportation for satellites. And am I right in saying that D-Orbit is the only company that can transport satellites to specific operational slots, which ultimately saves customers time and money? Is, is that right that you guys are the only people doing this? Yes. So currently we are the only company providing this service. Um, uh, this is a market that basically we started uh, and we immediately found a lot of requests from uh, satellite operators. So the satellite operators, they really see the value. Uh, um, it, it, it took some time, let's say, for them to digest the, the, the benefits, uh, the extra benefits. But what is happening now, uh, they are coming back to us even with new business models for their own business, because now they have access to locations that were not accessible before with a simple launch. They can deploy the satellite in a way that is completely different from the standard approach. So they are really changing uh, the way that they run their business. So uh, yes, we are the first. We are the first on uh, also on, on other additional services that we are delivering to the passengers that we have on board. Um, just an example, we can keep the satellite 
in, uh, in our cargo for longer time and just deploy when they are needed. So in this way, uh, you have your satellite that is already there is, uh, and, and you can have, if you have a failure in your constellation, uh, you know, it, it, this, this may happen, uh, then you have immediately a substitution satellite. And you don't need to send backup satellites before, right? So they are already there, ready, ready to be used. And that's, that's, that's really a good, a good aspect. Uh, whoever, as I said, we are the first, but we will not be the only one. And uh, I, I really hope that these uh, other companies will arrive into this market soon, because as uh, always uh, true for every sector, if you are the only one, probably it's not a market, right? So, yeah. um, and, uh, and we know that there are other very good companies that are working on that, and in, uh, they will be on the market in the next, uh, let's say, months or years. Uh, and uh, we are already talking with some of them to create synergies. Uh, pretty much as it's happening today in the like in the airplane sector, right? So if one plane is overbooked as, as we are now, then you you basically send your passengers to another airline in order to make sure that the customer is happy anyway and is able to travel and get to the final destination no matter what. And and the, also the companies that is providing the service. They are not losing customers for one side, but they are also cooperating to create uh, a benefit to the entire ecosystem. Because at the end of the story, if the entire ecosystem grows, all the companies within the ecosystem will grow. And before you came on the podcast, I was I was trying to learn a little bit more about this world. And I read that typically satellites are launched into space and then left to drift to their operational slots, which can actually take up to 10 months. So can you tell me more about how with deorbits ion satellite carrier, you can take satellites the last mile and deliver satellites within just a few weeks of launch. Is that right? Yes, yes. So um, uh, l- l- let's let's focus on a single orbit. So in a single, yeah. let's say, position in, in space, uh, and then uh, um, if you if you need to launch, let's say, I don't know, ten satellites there, then you really want the ten satellites equispaced around this circle around the uh, around the Earth, right? So in order to do that today, um, either so these satellites are small. So if they have propulsion on board and some of them uh, may have propulsion, the the quantity of propellant is very limited, and you really want to use the propulsion for your business. So if you put propulsion, it's because you really need it for your business. And you don't, you know, wasting propellant just to move from A to B is not really providing you revenues, right? Mm. Uh, If you don't have propellant, and that's the vast majority of the most satellites, they don't have propulsion on board, then there's nothing you can do. So what they do, they use a technique, it's called differential drag. Uh, that's, That's one technique. So basically they change the attitude of the satellite and the leverage, the, the difference in the, in the gravity field, uh, like solar wind and, uh, you know, the last layers of atmospheres. Anyway, so they, they used uh, a little bit of drugs to drift along the orbit. Uh, and this is very inefficient, but it's the only way. So it's, it's, it's not really inefficient because it's the only way. What we do, uh, well, we have a patented system that we can deploy the satellites in a like way faster way, but we have also the capability of moving from, from one place to another of the orbit. So not only we can deliver the satellite in equispace way, we call it dispersion, uh, way faster than it's happening today, as you mentioned, in a few weeks. But we can even go in a very precise position of uh, like in the constellation uh, to deploy a satellite exactly where the customer wants the satellite. So if you have a constellation operating and maybe you have a failure, so you you have lost one satellite, um, we can go there and replace the satellite with a new one. And I'm sure everyone listening has seen so many images of uh, space at the moment, and it just seems to be getting increasingly crowded up there. And you mentioned right at the beginning of the podcast about space debris. I, how much of a problem is that? Yeah, that's uh, that's one of the biggest problems that we have in space, and I believe that is the the largest bottleneck uh, that we have for the for the for the growth of the entire ecosystem. And um, it, it's a very well-known issue. So, you know, when we started our business, we immediately focused on that aspect because we we believe that if we don't if we don't make if we don't build a sustainable business 
Uh, and to me, sustainable doesn't mean let's save the trees. It's uh, let's do a good job and the trees will be saved automatically, right? So it, it's, uh, it's the other way around. Um, so if you don't build a sustainable business, there will be no business in the future in space. And if there is no business in space, then it will be a massive, massive impact on Earth, on all the activities on Earth. Because now we are really too much depending on the on, on the space infrastructure. So space debris is growing um, and it's, it's getting worse and worse with all the new satellite constellations that are launched. So, for example, in our uh, contracts, we clearly ask uh, to our customers to indicate that they have a, a mitigation strategy uh, for the end of life of their satellites. And I have to say that all our customers, and we have the tier one customers on the market now flying with us, uh, they are all uh, coming with a clear strategy for the end of life. So they are you know, uh, really good companies that understand the issue and they want to help to mitigate the problem. But no matter what, the number of objects sent in space is really really, really a lot. So uh, what we so we are at the point now that even if your satellite have you know residual propellant or is flying in very low orbit and it can be removed uh, within the 25 years today required by law, this is not enough anymore. Uh, 25 years is really an anachronistic number now. Um, and uh, so we need to do something different. So what we are working on as well, and we, we just got um, uh, one year ago a contract with a large satellite operator, it's uh, active debris removal. So something that can, uh, a vehicle that can grab an existing satellite that is not working anymore and properly dispose the satellite. This is what we need. So we need to be proactive now. We cannot just rely on uh, on the technology of our satellites because once they die, there's nothing you can do. So you need another strategy. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm also pleased to say uh, that currently in orbit, there is um, a demo mission from uh, Astroscape. There is uh, another great company working in the new space domain that they are going to perform uh, an initial test exactly for this active debris removal. So, and uh, uh, Nobu and I, and uh, together with Luke from uh, Clear Space, another company that is, uh, you know, aiming to address this problem. We have um, a conversation, let's say, every couple of months in order to uh, work together in this domain. Because as I said, it's not one company that will make the difference. It's the ecosystem that will make the difference. I completely agree with you there. And as we mentioned a few moments ago, Elon Musk and his space tech company is on a mission to build a sustainable city on Mars and make humans an interplanetary species. But what role do you see deorbit playing in that exciting future? Yeah, Elon Musk is, is really is really changing again the equation, right? So he's demonstrating again that this is possible and uh, that it's not just possible, technically speaking, but possible also from a business perspective. That's that's very important because uh, if you have um, uh, like a business, uh, then you have investors and then you have way more customers and this, uh, this uh, is driving the sustainability of the business as well. So um, our role in this case, it's really uh, in terms of logistics infrastructure. So as I mentioned, um, there will be a need of not just transporting people there, there will be a need of having recurrent uh, flights uh, from one location to another, transporting um, supplies and uh, maybe also people in the future, but let's say supplies in general. It's pretty much like um, what, what you find on Earth. If you, if you take a uh, like, um, like few islands, they are all connected by boats, right? There are transporting water, foods, people, and so on. And this is uh, the most efficient way to ensure that everybody that need to travel from one island to another, uh, they do it in the cheapest and fastest way. So uh, this is our role. So we are building that, making sure that this infrastructure is helping SpaceX and all the other players that are aiming to do business in space and also, and this is very important, to do it in the safest way possible. So as I mentioned, uh, whatever problem you create in space today is going to be exponentially bigger in a very short amount of time. So uh, owning the infrastructure, or say helping 
building infrastructure allow us also to set some rules or at least to provide some suggestions on how to use the infrastructure. And this is another you know, important piece of our activity. And I think if we look back at our past, that there was the space race and nations were competing against each other to achieve their goals. But I'm curious, is that changing? And are you seeing more collaboration and, and support inside the space community where people are uniting? Because that, that's the only way we can all move forward together, isn't it, really? Yeah, yeah. So, y- yes. So, um it- we are in a in a new space race now, right? So, but it's not between governments; uh, it's it's uh, it's uh, between companies. Yeah. Uh, but yes, it's played in a different way because companies, yes, companies compete, but they also cooperate. So, um, like a, a, a supplier can become a partner, a customer can can become uh, a partner as well, a competitor can become a partner. We are working with companies that are willing to you know, enter into our own market that sooner or later, they will also transport satellites and other stuff in orbit. But if we don't work together today, it will be way, way more difficult even for the orbit in the future to move on. So we need an ecosystem that is working. We need to to remember that this new space market, it's very young. So it started only a few years ago. And as every other market uh you know you you go for automotive electric cars uh but even uh energy electricity and you know any any other sector uh, any other industry on earth went through pretty much the same roadmap so at the beginning every market at the, in a phase in which the market is growing exponentially it's also weaker than in the, in the next phase so it's exactly because of that that you need to work together in order to make sure that there will be a way better market uh, in the future. So that's why, yes, companies are competing on many different aspects, but they are also working together. And um, a- another role that is important, that is uh, connecting the dots, if you want, and enabling this, it's really the government. So we are not forgetting governments at all. Governments are still a very important role. It's a different role from the past. So governments are not anymore a market itself, so uh, they, they are not just providing cash to companies, uh, they are enabling companies, um, buying services from companies. And that's that's a, really the evolution of the government aspects that are enabling companies, especially imagine the young company that need the validation and need the first customer. Uh, this is the new role of the government that will accelerate the business and these companies will, you know, uh, get to market way faster, introduce innovation, and then maybe acquire by other companies and, you know, uh, uh, feeding the a positive evolution of the sector. And it is an incredibly exciting uh, time in the industry right now. So I've got to ask, what is it that excites you most about your work at Deorbit now? And what makes you jump out of bed in the morning? Oh, yeah. So let's say, <laughs> Uh, you know, I have a <clears throat> I have a technical background. So, yeah. so I was an engineer and uh, a PhD, you know, whatever. Then I studied business and so on. But when you when you have to drive a company, so you are a CEO, then basically you spend ninety eight percent of your time doing something that every engineer on the planet will hate, right? So, <laughs> but the two percent, the two percent. That's that's what. Uh, keep you moving as fast as possible at, you know and and the two percent is walking in the company and talking with the people that are creating something that is not existing and you feel that they uh, that you know they are almost scared because they they have no reference so and uh, but the, the their eyes the sp- the sparks in their eyes, right? So uh, when you see that and and you see the results, and when you, you have a satellite in orbit with a like propulsion system that is working and the satellites deployed and everything is going fine, and the the like the happiness and the and the pride of the people here, wow, wow, that's that's really what 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 make me go to the to the second day, third day, fourth day, months, years. That's 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 amazing. 
Absolutely love that. And to leave the guests on an inspiring note too, a question I always ask my guests is what song has inspired you in the past, helped you in your career, uh, get your head in the zone or remind you of technology and space? What would your song be and why? And the reason I ask is I'm going to put that on a Spotify playlist where each guest will add a song to that list. But what would your song be? Well, let, let's say it, it's it's a, it, it's a very nice question. Um, um, I have uh, several songs, you know, that, 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 because uh, when you build a company, uh, 90% of what you do uh, doesn't work. And then there is 10% it's actually is moving you to the next level, right? So then mm-hmm. problems, 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 and then success. Problems, problems, problems. So, uh, and you have a, a lot of songs for all the moments, right? So motivation songs and then celebration songs. But let's say if uh, if I have to, um, uh, to mention um, a, a group that it's really uh, in uh, almost in every day, uh, it's, uh, it's probably uh, someone that uh, I, I don't know if who is listening to us. They, they, they know who they are, but it's uh, the Blues Brothers. So uh, because the way they were playing the, their songs and the, the rhythm and the, the passion that you feel was really what we, we needed. And uh, so the Blues Brothers is what we use. Um, and then if I have to add uh, another one, because this is really what uh, changed my, uh, my understanding of music um, when I was younger, uh, is, is the Queen. So especially uh, in the last phase, when the, the messages that they were delivering were particularly strong uh, and effective, uh, definitely that, that, that they also were a source of motivation for me. Love that. And for anyone listening that would like to find out more information about anything we talked about today, the great work you're doing at Diorbit and contact your team even, where's the best starting point for that? Well, first of all, the, our website, there is uh, space. Um, and definitely you, you, you all our social um, Instagram and LinkedIn. Uh, you can access to that and uh, ask any questions or contact us directly. And uh, our head of communication will be happy to provide you with all the information. Well, I just, just love chatting with you today. I, I, th- I love how as humanity we're starting to explore the art of the possible and think bigger and we can achieve anything if we all work together. And the role that you're playing in that with space logistics technology inspirational it really is so a big thank you for joining me on the podcast today thank you neil and if if i may say one last thing um so uh because most of the people think that space is very far and we have other issues here to deal with right on earth uh first of all most of these issues are really solved thanks to the space utilization satellites images and data and this is very important uh even if Probably we don't realize it. It's already happening. And second, that I think it's uh, it, it's important. So if we put ourselves in 500 years in the future, right? So so far in the future that it's impossible to understand which type of technologies we are going to use and and so on. But it's likely that we will be in other planets. That we'll be traveling from one planet to another. As today we we take a plane to go to US or to UK, right? So. The, the roadmap that uh, will bring our society into 500 years in the future, sooner or later, should start. So why not today? Why not today? And I think we already start this path. We already, spa- we already started this journey. And uh, we are at the beginning. But what we are doing today it, it, is, it will be so important for the future evolution of our society that we really need smart people, talents, not just in the space sector, from all the other sectors, to inject into the space sector what was already achieved in other sectors and innovation that we can use and exploit in the space sector as well. Wow, what a powerful moment to end on. Thanks again, Luca. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow, what a great guy. An inspiring conversation. Not only that, he lives in a beautiful part of the world in Italy, which is one of my favourite countries in the world, and he lives near Lake Como. So I'm going to invite myself over there to have a cold beer and a nice meal by that lake with him one day. 
And he has really got me thinking about space logistics and the space logistics technology and how just as companies on Earth depend on logistics providers, the future of space, including satellites and human expansion, etc., also require logistics companies. And as we said in the interview there, Deorbit is the first company addressing these needs. This could include satellite life extension, active de- space debris removal, interplanetary logistics, and so much more. So I cannot thank him enough for joining me on the podcast today and helping you, the listeners of this podcast, wherever you are in the world, to look up to the stars and dare to think bigger, dare to dream bigger, and explore the art of the possible. So please share with me where you're listening to this podcast today, your questions, comments, song suggestions for our Spotify playlist and anything else at all by simply emailing me techblogwriter at outlook.com, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, all the usual platforms you should find me at Neil C. Hughes. And my website is techblogwriter.co.uk, where we're heading towards 1,600 interviews there. So there's lots to keep everyone happy, quiet, out of mischief, whatever takes your fancy. So I hope you enjoyed today's conversation as much as I did. I'm going to explore a completely different industry tomorrow, and we'll hopefully learn together how technology is transforming that too. But have a fantastic rest of your day. I hope you'll join me again tomorrow. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for listening. And until next time, don't be a stranger. Thank you for listening to the Tech Talks Daily Podcast with Neil C. Hughes. Remember, technology works best when it brings people together.